Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for a special edition of the show. I'm here with Jason Santani, a uh, winemaker here at Yano Estacado, and it's not Leno, that's the name of the town. <laughs> Yano Estacado, and uh, he's been super kind. We've spent actually a lot of time in the winery, going through a whole bunch of stuff, and tasting a lot of barrel samples. And we've got a little lineup of wines we're gonna, we're gonna go through here. And uh, yeah, so Jason, kind of uh, introduce yourself and kind of tell people who you are and how you got to, how you got to here. Sure. Um, I came to Yano Staccato in 2005, uh, fresh out of college from mm -hmm. the University of Houston. So I, I lived and worked and went to school in the Houston area. Uh, that was my home for 20 plus years. Grew up there. Um, I got, I originally was not going to go to school for wine. I kind of fell into it, um, fell in love with it. Yeah. And, um, and kind of very fortuitously got uh, you know a job here and worked my way up through the cellars, uh, lab and cellars um, uh, from 2005 um, to 2011 where I was assistant winemaker. Did some trips, um, you know, working in either uh, New Zealand or in California for a couple harvests, um, and then I was able to earn the winemaking uh, role here in 2015. So. Um, Basically been at Yano Estacado my entire winemaking life. Yeah. <laughs> and then now I've been in Lubbock for almost 15 years and I'm becoming a um, kind of establishing some roots here mm -hmm. and becoming a Lubbockite West Texan. So, yeah. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> I was, I was telling Jason that it's probably been like 30 years, probably actually longer than 30 years since I've been to Lubbock. So uh, this has been uh, so far just an amazing trip. Um, I mean, I, I've been here for a whole, for almost a whole day. Uh, well, not quite. I got in yesterday afternoon, but uh, hanging out uh, with Neil Newsom, which that you'll see that in a couple episodes. But um, it's been really cool to come out here, and you know the it's a different world, right? It's a different world. <laughs> um, you know, so I kind of while we we're in the tasting room, I was talking about like let's let's just start with the name Yano Staccato, and then we can kind of then we'll go back in time to re kind of revisit our our trip through the winery. So. Kind of tell me about the geography and what what the what the uh, name kind of basically means, and then we can go from there. Sure, it's a very unique place. This whole area, we're essentially um, right at around a thousand meters, so thirty three hundred feet mm -hmm. elevation. That's about where the town sits, and which is much higher than the rest of the state. And what that does, it creates a totally different climate than what the rest of the state has. Um, the name itself, Yano Estacado. Um, it loosely translates to staked plains. And so a stake, this would be like a stake in the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and the story is that when the conquistadors came out here looking, you know, traveling around looking for Cebolla, the city of gold, yeah. um, they, this is like a treeless, <laughs> mostly waterless, semi-arid plain, high plateau, that is massive, uh, several million acres. It basically extends from the city of Post, which is southeast of here, about 45 miles. And it goes into, essentially, into the foothills of the southern Rockies into New Mexico. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's you know, there's no, there's no native landmarks really anywhere. And so the story is that the conquistadors, you know, in order to not go in circles or not get lost, <laughs> yeah, the stakes in the ground. And so they called it the staked plain, the Llano Estacado. Okay. And that's a loose translation, and who knows how accurate that story really is. Um, but um, when there was a time for, uh, when it was allowed for wineries to name uh, themselves after a geographical area, you know, that's the original founders of this winery did that. Okay. 
So uh, nowadays you can't do that. You can't. Now it's becoming more of a, a, a place known to grow wine grapes. And a, you know, there's an AVA here. Right. You can't do that, but we got kind of locked in. So if I wanted to start Texas High Plains Winery, yeah, can't I wouldn't be able to do it. No. Yeah, yeah but like you know, uh, Alexander Valley Vineyards. Yeah, they were lo- just like they were there. They were there before and sat in the Stagley too. Yeah. Actually, I actually remember. Um, I don't remember why they did it, but both. This, the, 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 the two founders of Stags League were not exactly the best of friends, if I remember the story correctly. If I'm wrong, please don't please don't tell me I'm wrong. I mean, tell me I'm wrong, but don't, don't, don't come kill me. But when they were creating the Stags League district, apparently they became, not best buds, but they, they became allies because they were against it. Yeah. They actually didn't want to, which I don't know why, but maybe if I ever talk to any of them, if they're still around. Um, in this, but yeah, that, so yeah, one of the guys in Colorado now. Yeah, more than when you are skiing. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, so anyway, um, so yeah, cool. So we're out here in the Texas High Plains. Uh, we're in a high altitude area. I know it doesn't sound like high altitude. I mean, you don't think high altitude because you don't see any mountains. Um, there are very small hills. <laughs> uh, driving out here, uh, so from San Antonio to where I'm actually staying, or even here, it's about the same about the same amount of time. It's about a six hour drive, mm-hmm. but you start seeing about a couple hours outside when you, before I arrive, you start seeing that slow incline. Yeah. Um, you can really see on the road, it's easy on the road because the road, you can see it, and the road will kind of go up and then be flat for a little bit and go up, and you'll start seeing it, but it's a slow incline. And yeah, I think uh, out where I'm at is about 3,700 yeah. feet, something like that. Um, Close you get to New Mexico line. I think New Mexico line's right at like 4,000 feet. Okay. So you just start this gradual, and it's like a, I'm probably wrong here, but it's it's I mean it's less than a one percent slope. Yeah, it's but it's just keep, but it does. I mean it's I mean Neil's several hundred feet tall, you know, higher than we are. Yeah, and he's about sixty miles west, the town sixty to seventy miles. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's not very dramatic, but it does rise. It does <laughs> rise. You know, before you know it, you're you're like at four thousand feet. You know, thirty seven hundred, thirty three hundred feet, and you're like, oh, I didn't realize that. Um, they also call it the Cap Rock. The Cap Rock. Yeah, we we're talking about that. So and that really has to talk about the dramatic drop off. Um, and I don't know all the geological history, but I think this was you know millions of years ago. This was like a sandy beach. You know, okay. This was like the beach. Or the whenever there was like a shallow sea over Texas, or maybe a deep sea in some spots, mm-hmm. but the water came up to this area, and so the okay. cap rock is where basically like the the shelf where it dropped off. Okay, and so you can see um, when you're driving up through Post where it's a pretty dramatic, you know, increase in elevation, <clears throat> you can see basically the drop off, and it okay, and it basically um, it forms like a crescent moon shape, I guess, around. Kind of south west, southeast of Lubbock, going all the way down past uh, La Mesa, kind of almost getting to I twenty on the southwest area, closer okay. to Midland, Odessa. Right. Um, but that's where the dramatic increase in elevation occurs during uh, right on that Cap Rock. Okay. So yeah. and there's of course a winery named Cap Rock. Right yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and they've been, they, yeah, they've got their ups and downs. <laughs> yeah, they've got ups and downs. Got a history. They did have history. But we're not here to talk about the, the, that winery. We're talking about your winery here. So um, let's just kind of start with, um, you, you make quite a wide variety of wines. Um, I mean, this yes. is definitely just a small sampling. Very small. Um, <laughs> about a ballpark figure about how many wines are you, are you doing right now? Um, I think we've got here in the winery, the tasting room, which we'll, you'll find the most varied selection there's about 50 SKUs okay and um, SKUs yeah and out in the marketplace say any given say HEB they probably have our, the most lineup of Viano right wines. Um, there's probably in the neighborhood of like 15 to 20 okay. that we found say probably averaging like 15 or something like that okay and that would be our best representation um, but just any given uh, retail outlet, which is mainly how we, we sell our wines, grocery stores, um, there's at least like five to seven. Okay. And um, yeah, we're, we're represented well across the state. Across the state. Mm-hmm. But the wines that we um, kind of have at this table, you know, this is very tiny production. Um, most of these are small production, but um, I mean, some of, some of our production goes from minuscule to say some of our biggest sellers like Sweet Red, which is like tens of thousands of cases. Almost, yeah. Almost a hundred thousand cases. So but there's a there's a pretty decent market in Texas for that. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. 
We're we're kind of winemakers for the people. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, I mean, yeah. I mean, your your winery is is you know you've got to make your business and you want to yeah. it please as many people as possible and. You know, there's still definitely, and it's not just Texas. I know that the, a sweet wine, sweet wine, is still a thing, really, pretty much nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, but Texas, Texans seem to have like this a sweet spot for sweet wine. Yeah, you know, and that's and that's fine. They're technical wines to make. Um, they can be absolutely entry level for a lot of people, and then they evolve um, as their tastes evolve mm -hmm. into 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 different wines, drier wines maybe. But that's what that's what's great about wine. There's so many different wines out there. Yes, like you can try all this new stuff all the time. And this is like in the history of wine, the most availability and the best wines ever. So mm -hmm. consumers have, you know, they've got a lot of great spoiled options out there. We're very spoiled. <laughs> We're very spoiled right now compared to you know even a hundred years ago. Yeah. yeah. But I like to. What I want to try to do in all of our wines is try to over deliver value. Okay. And um, you know, knowing that people, you know, if if they even if they if they're just lifelong customers, that's awesome. That's great. Thank you for the support. Um, but even if they come back, knowing that when they try a, a wine from Yano Staccato, um, that it's going to be consistent um, and, and a solid wine um, at an affordable price, typically, yeah. is, is kind of what we're shooting for. So, And that's something that you know previous winemakers have you know done, and I'm trying to keep that, you know, right. continue that during my tenure here. Yeah, we, we definitely talked about, you know, the challenges and how you were able to establish that um, uh, before we got started, mm -hmm. um, and you know we know that uh, as far as a um, you know as an industry here in Texas, you know we don't have necessarily enough grapes for everybody. It's yeah. It, I mean, you could, historic, you could, historically, it's anyone, anyone right. could start a winery and, and just and, and yeah, you do it. But absolutely, and that's typically what it is. Wine raising group. The winery business is kind of outpacing the the grape growing business mm -hmm. a little bit. It's starting to catch up a little bit. Yeah. Um, but you know, right now, um, the the grapes at the right the grapes at the prices that we need them for our value driven wines um, and, and, and expensive wines are just not there yet. We're yeah. Not there yet. But we're getting there. We're making some some steps. Uh, yeah. Some growers in this area, um, or farmers in this area, have diversified into grapes, and are um, I think they're going to be a big contributor to to be able to um, get productivity up and, and get the prices down where larger wineries like us need them to be, right? Um, to continue to grow this industry. Yeah. Um, when, when, we, when I sit down with Neil in a couple, well, in tomorrow when I sit down, but in two weeks, whatever, when you guys see this, I mean, Neil and I will probably talk really a lot about farming and, and the challenges and, and, and the stuff to that, but is there, is there anything you want to talk about, like what makes the High Plains what it is? Sure. Um, versus maybe even just the hill country of Texas. Well, geographically, and more importantly, how it um, plays into the to the, the grapes that are grown. We talked about the elevation. Uh, the elevation basically shifts, and the proximity to the um, to the rock, the southern Rocky Mountains that go through New Mexico, it creates a semi-arid climate, um, where we're averaging less than twenty inches a year of rain rainfall, and that's scattered throughout the year. And okay. predominantly fall during the growing through the growing season, which is different from like say a Mediterranean climate that gets zero rain during the growing great growing season, right? In summer months. Um, so yeah, the elevation helps keep um, the humidity down. It helps uh, create a diurnal shift, so that's a shift between temperatures on the day and the night. And typically out here, it's about thirty degrees. Mm -hmm. So if it's one hundred degrees that during the day, it'll still drop down to at least seventy. Sometimes usually cooler, a little bit cooler. Yeah. Um, it doesn't get very. It doesn't get too cold here during the growing season. Um, it's rare to get in the fifties. Maybe Neil's side may get in the fifties, high fifties, yeah. but typically we're in the sixties. Mm -hmm. But that does help uh, slow um, the the development of the vine, the growth of the vine, the ripening down. So if we get a, a longer growing season, we're able to um, ripen our crop and, for the most part, mature our red varieties and some of the whites that do need the extra hang time. So it's getting into more of a a um, not the most hospitable place for Vitis vinifera, you know, European wine grape, which is really like needs a Mediterranean climate to be like in its native environment, <laughs> but getting pretty close um, to where it's you know adapted, and the and the vines do adapt pretty well, plants adapt pretty well. Yeah, it's adapted to a little bit of a harsher growing condition, but not harsh enough for anything. Right. Yeah. Um, 
but enough where it, there's some challenges, but it still can make a unique, uh, a unique uh, grape on any given growing season, and, and then thus make a pretty unique wine out of it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's uh, I say the elevation, the dry climate that we have, the dry, you know, uh, low humidity. Um, the amount of sunlight we get is amazing. Yeah, it's wow. really it's intense. So you can yeah. you can do some cool things in terms of, you know, if you do have some slope to play with out here, or direction of your vines, uh, the way you planted them. Um, the wind is another factor out here. It can it can hurt us quite a bit, but it can also help us quite a bit. So if we have a wet growing season, it's going to dry you out the next day. Yeah, the sand, the soils out here are super unique. A lot of people just play off as that's just sand. Well, yeah, there's a lot of sand, but depending on how, you know, the depth of your soil, you can have some really cool stuff going on underneath. Um, higher amounts of clay, more rocks. There's always, it's, it's all kind of calcareous in nature. Right. Um, Basically have a limestone. Yeah, it's a form. It's not quite. quite it's, yeah, it's not quite like just a limestone, which you see down in the hill country, but it is calcareous in nature. There's more caliche. Mm -hmm. It's just a calcium based rock that's still present. So, um, you know, the, the, the benefit that rocks play during <laughs> yeah. growing and everything, the minerality, whatever yeah. that bring to the table, there's something going on here. Um, so yeah, all those factors kind of um, contribute to us being able to, this area being able to, to grow some wine grapes at a, a pretty good level, you know, yeah. high, well, a high, pretty high quality level. Um, so yeah, I would say that kind of encompasses the Yana Westacado, the yeah. Texas High Plains, the cap rock, if you will. Right, the cap rock, <laughs> right, yeah. So, um, uh, so can I talk about the winery, how it was founded, and who sure. and people that were, that were kind of behind it? Because there's some pretty big names, you know. Yeah, of, absolutely. You know, of the Texas wine industry in this thing, so, yeah. Um, so the history of the winery, of course, I wasn't around, but um, it was it was established in the mid-70s by um, Dr. Clint McPherson. And, and Bob Reed, they're both professors at Texas Tech University. And they were in, both interested in wine, they like to drink wine, they were interested to see if they could grow um, hybrid vines mm -hmm. um, to produce wine, you know, palatable, possibly even, um, you know, marketable wine. Um, they started out um, just, at this time, the town of Lubbock was dry. Okay, the city was dry. In yeah. fact, it didn't even go wet. You couldn't even buy alcohol, you know, at a grocery store or, or liquor store or anything until 2010. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the city was dry. The county was wet. So they had to go outside the city limits to do any of this tinkering. Um, the story there was a story about um, I don't know how true this is, but um, they were they were making some wine at Texas Tech. Uh, Dr. McPherson was a um, chemistry professor, so he uh, and Kim might be able to tell you more later. If yeah. But he apparently he was making wine in the basement and he got in trouble for it. And so they, they had to take his projects outside of, you know, outside of the uh, university, outside <laughs> of the city. Right. So they built a little, they, they grew, they planted some grapes out here, this, the current site, the current location, uh, plus another location just north of here, a couple of miles it's called Sagamore Vineyard. Okay. It's a pretty old vineyard. Um, they may have grown it there first, but anyways, they grew some wine and grapes out here. They first planted like Baco Noir and some hybrids. And then they jumped into, um, they made some wine out of it and then realized, eh, it's not that great. So let's try some of the, you know, the European grape species, the traditional yeah. uh, wine grapes. And they planted those, made some wine out of that, and they're like, hey, this is pretty good. You know, this is at least something we might be able to market and sell and make a commercial wine, a venture out of. Right. Um, and this was probably the late 70s at this point. So they, um, they convinced some investors to come on board. Um, and help expand, get get some capital in, and expand the you know the operation, which they did in the early '80s. Um, I, I believe Kim McPherson had come back at this time from college, and had helped his dad out, helped grow the winery. Um, through the '80s, there was more winemakers that came through, more professionals, um, guys like Don Brady. You know, he's in California now. Mm -hmm. um, who else came through during that time? Mark Penna was here. He yeah. he helped grow the Mesa Vineyards for, uh, in Fort Stockton, which is St. Genevieve. Um, I'm probably missing one. We talked about Kim McPherson. He was yeah. here for a little bit. Um, but during this growth phase, we had all, all the winemakers who were you know pr still present in the in the wine industry, either in Texas or or in, in California. Um, during the '90s, 
my boss, Greg Rooney, came on board, with, and then as well as our company president, his name is mm-hmm. Mark Heineman. Um, they both brought their level of expertise um, to the table and just helped bring the winery where it's at now. Yeah. And um, so during the 90s, you know, there was um, just a big shift on how we um, sold wine, how we made wine, where we sourced grapes from, um, and also development of new, project, uh, new products. And it basically took this winery from like 30,000 cases where it kind of had, had, had stagnant and just kind of plateaued and brought it up to over 100,000. And at one point, almost close to 200,000 cases. We yeah. had a big growth phase during the 2000s. When I came in in 2005, you know, we were basically more or less set up where we're at now you know, in terms of sales. We were selling most of our wine through uh, grocery store sales throughout the state. Um, pretty good business or tasting room. But mainly focused, you know, on distributed, um, you know, wholesale uh, uh, sold wine, and um, that's kind of where we're where we're at now. Okay. Um, that's our big focus. My previous, the previous winemaker that was here, his name was Chris Hole. I learned a lot from him. He's still working in the lo- one of the local wineries around here. Um, but I guess I'm like probably the eighth or ninth winemaker mm-hmm. at Yano Staccato. Um, 40 plus years, you know, with the last, say, 20 years being really, like, out there. Yeah. Starting to develop a, you know, a, a following and, and people and, and, and recognition of the, of the brand. Right. We've, we've started jumping into the on-premise world with some of these different brands. Yeah. <laughs> but mainly, you know, the bread and butter has been um, wholesale. Right. Um, and that's what's um, kind of brought this winery to the level it's at today. Yeah, I mean, you have to realize, I mean, we're not in the Texas Hill Country where everyone goes to taste wine. No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, the taste room opens at noon. <laughs> and I mean, I'm sure some people will come through, but it is, it's Wednesday, what say? It's a Wednesday, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, in my experience, at least in other wine areas where there's lots of people that come through, during the week, usually not too busy. The weekends, yes, but... Uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, there's definitely, it's pretty, most of the year is pretty slow around here. Um, I mean, this is a university town, right, in an agrarian area. So most people are passing through um, to Colorado. <laughs> or they're visiting their kids <laughs> in college. Or they're visiting their kids <laughs> in college. Yeah. Or <laughs> going to football so games. Our busy, yeah, our busiest time is um, yeah, during the, the football months, uh, yeah. during the fall. Um, the summertime, like I said, people traveling passing through the area and they'll stop by yeah but yeah most of the most of the time it's slow um but it's i think we open a lot of people's eyes when they do stop stop here for a tasting they're like wow you know we just knew you guys for sweet red or um you know maybe signature series wines right yeah what we see in the grocery store you guys have a lot of you have all this it's all this other stuff stuff. yeah yeah i didn't didn't plan enough time dude (laughs) yeah exactly exactly so we, we went to the winery and uh, we kind of walked around and uh, saw some tanks. Um, you showed me some of the barrel stuff. So this is actually kind of cool is that um, uh, not that I've never seen a combination of barrel sizes, but really just the amount of punches you have. I don't know why I kept calling them Fudras. You have Fudras. <laughs> he has Fudras, but just, just you. So uh, real quick, so, so you have the standard Bordeaux size barrel 225 liters and then you have the punch which is 500 right 500, yeah. and then you have the fuger which yours is 25 different yeah, yeah, yeah yours is like we can be anything really. 2500 liter 25 hectoliter and then i have a 50 hectoliter which yeah is the bigger one yeah and that's just the food is just like a catch-all for mostly italians use them but french will use them too yeah just, they're just big barrels yeah they're either oak upright tanks which those are upright tanks yeah i think the italians they do more of the uh I don't know. I mean, I guess in Europe they do all the different yeah, styles. Yeah, yeah. They have the ones that are on their sides, the casks, the big, right. the larger casks. Yeah, so. and when I saw the Fudra, it looked, it, it's really kind of like just like a, it reminded me of being in Burgundy and seeing like the open top ferment, you know, barrel fermenters. And I thought, well, this is kind of a mini one, but because I couldn't see over yeah. the top. But, um, but yeah, so we got to do all that um, and uh, went to the lab, talked about lab stuff. I mean, it's the best lab in the state. Yeah. Talk about lab <laughs> stuff. Got to see, got to see a couple of lab people there, and um, got to see a cool machine that that analyzes basically everything you know, for the most part. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we did that, and and you, you know, 
most winery tours, the lab is not the sexy part to go to, but you know, you have to analyze your wine. So we got that, but we tasted some stuff out of, out of barrels, which, um, you know, this is one of these about going to wineries that I, I experience not every time, but a lot of times I get to experience this and, um, we, we tasted a whole bunch of cool stuff. So let's talk about like, um, we had in the, the Fudra was the cab Syrah blend, right? Yeah. Wow. And basically, we were, I remember which one it was. Yeah. It was an eight, maybe an eighty twenty, maybe. Yeah, we tasted everything um, we tasted today was twenty eighteen vintage too. So okay, new vintage stuff, and, and it was a good time to taste though because um, coming into the spring, following the vintage, the wines are starting to kind of they're starting to open up, they're starting yeah. to showcase you know what they've got coming out of reduction, kind of a reductive phase and and um, a little more approachable. Sometimes, it, of course, the tannins can be a little rough at this point. Yeah. Or not. I mean, that's why it's just fun to taste them. Right, yeah. But we essentially had um, that Fudra, we um, had, had it previously filled with Syrah, but um, we don't want to, we had just emptied it. We don't want to keep it empty too long. So we had transferred some barrels of, a, of essentially what's going to be our reserve Cabernet for the 2018 from the 2018 vintage. Okay. We'd taken them out of the small oak and put them into the Fudra because they're going to be aging for another, um, what a month is it? It'd be another eight months before we bottle it. Okay. So we wanted to keep that Fudra filled up. So you get just tasted the, the wine that we refilled it with. Yeah. So it was like yeah. effectively brand new. Yeah. So it caps Roblin and it'll be a good fit for the Fudra because the, the oak that, uh, the oak tannins and the, and the, um, aromatics, oak aromatics that we needed to apply had already been applied to that wine. In this case, it's just an aging phase, um, kind of a slow permeation of oxygen mm -hmm. going to be coming through the barrels, or in this case, the Fudra right. uh, sides. Um, and so, um, you know, we'll continue to age it on some leaves, the leaves that are in the barrel kind of transferred over. And it'll just be a slow aging process um, in that Fudra, which is really what I'm going for. Right. Right? I want to slow oxidative, I want to slow aging. Um, I don't want to have, um, you know, kind of a, a really quick, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, get that wine into an oxidative phase too quickly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we'll see if it's, uh, I think it'll be a good fit for it. Um, I thought it was a fantastic fit for the Syrah. Um, we just need to use that Syrah. <laughs> yeah, right. So um, real quick uh, for the viewers, can you kind of explain what reduction is and what, what it's doing to the wine? Because sure. not everybody may not know yeah, what that, what that good, is doing. Good point. So um, there's a reduction and oxidation. Those mm -hmm. are the two. If, if, if uh, there's a one-way or if there's a one-lane street, those are the opposite ends on a one-lane street. Or yeah, yeah one-lane street. So reduction would be on the way left side, and that's like the ultimate form of reduction of the flaw component is hydrogen sulfide. Mm -hmm. um, there's different character, different molecules that can be associated with reduction, um, but the stinkiest are, is hydrogen sulfide. That's your rotten egg smell. Yeah. Okay. You can get some methyl mercaptan, some mercaptan smells, which can kind of start getting into the rubbery or a canned asparagus, kind of canned vegetable, yeah. um, garlic, onion kind of range. Mm -hmm. Typically you find those in white wines. Um, tar can be a reductive smell. Yeah. Um, tar and kind of rubber can be a reductive smell that you find in wines. Um, so that's kind of like the reductive smells, okay? But reduction is like lower, less oxygen, you know, being a, uh, kind of found into the wine or less oxidative products. Mm -hmm being shown and that's okay like if you kind of keep it in that area while you're while you're aging the wine while you're getting small amounts of oxygen in, into the wine say you're aging it in a barrel yes yeah. that's, that's how you get slow formations of mm -hmm. oxygen um that's okay it kind of allows you it gives you a little protection oxidation on the other end would be like what you find in port aromatics you find in port or sherry yeah madeira those are like the you know the um madeira especially being that total oxidized wine smell, the ultimate, you know, phase, I guess the ultimate phase of oxidation would be volatile, it would be vinegar. vinegar. Yeah. Vinegar. <laughs> that's the extreme, yeah, but at that point, that's like talking about totally, you know, that's talking about vinegar. Yeah. But for wine, you know, controlled or just extreme, um, limit would be like the Madeira phase. And then, so you find like table wines are somewhere in between and then whether in the bottle or in the barrel, um, you know, depending on what you're you're going for, what the what the uh, I guess time frame for that particular bottle 
you know, the lifespan for that bottle, certain phases you want to have it in a different zone on that on that scale. Right. If that makes sense. <laughs> does, well, I, I, I know what you're talking about. And I mean, uh, some of the sidebar, I mean, oxygen can be a wine's best friend and it's also a source of enemies. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's something um, I've learned through my winemaking, um, you know, just life. You know, this, this craft that we do is about utilizing the natural tools that come in, you know, with the grapes, mm -hmm. um, natural raw product uh, or, and, and byproducts that are, that are made or available. And then you have oxygen. And most, you know, the atmosphere is not that, and it's only 20% oxygen. Yeah, it's a little more nitrogen. More nitrogen, yeah. Nitrogen, yeah. 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 Okay. So, well, I remember that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it can still do some damage or it can be very beneficial. Yeah. So it's about knowing how to apply these tools and what's available at the right time. So right. early on, yeah, you can throw a bunch of oxygen at red wines. In fact, it's best to do that. And then as they get older and older, you have to control it. It's almost like, it's almost like, I guess, giving it a, like an inoculation for later on. Almost not quite, not like not like a flu shot, but uh, it helps. It helps the development early on if you if you hit it with oxygen. Then later on, you want to, you don't want to have as much going in. Yeah, I think yeah. Um, there's a guy in California, a winemaker named Randall Graham. He talks about it more like your chi, the chi of the wine, strong early on. Yeah, we're talking about red wines here. Yeah. some wines, but mostly reds. It's strong, so you can give it a lot of oxygen, which can, you know, in this case, form and make it even stronger. Um, and then when it's older, it has to protect its G. You can't give it too much or it'll just, okay. it's too fragile. It'll, it'll fall apart. Yeah, so. without getting too chemical technical, <laughs> um, it's basically just the, I, and I might be wrong, but it's the anthocyanins because there's more of it, or just, there's more of the red, script, the red, the red, red grape skin yeah. that allows the, with the tannin and the, I guess, anthocyanins, I think. You'll probably yeah, correct me. Anthocyanins are a form, a form of tannin. Yeah. Yeah. Phenol. Phenol, phenol, yeah. yeah. But that they, they are able to absorb the oxygen without oxidizing better than a white wine. They don't really have the same polyphenol. Yeah, it's a there's a um, a linking that occurs, a polymerization. Yeah. So you go from one molecule to say two or more than that. Yeah. Polymerizing, the oxygen is a catalyst. It polymerizes and then thus stabilizes your anthocyanin. Anthocyanin is the color molecule that you can see in visible light. Right. Yeah. So it's important. So yeah, oxygen early on helps stabilize the color. Yeah. In, in a nutshell. So is, is this a good point? Can we talk about microx? Microx, sure. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Micro oxygenation. Yeah. Micox, mox. I guess. Mox, S A. Yeah. That's a micro boulage if you're in France. <laughs> <laughs> or not though. <laughs> so yeah. So we. I got to see that. So I see. I'm not saying I've never been to a winery that doesn't do it i just have never it's never been pointed out or i've never actually seen the equipment that that does it so yeah um hopefully this is my cue to put in my little uh, video from my little camera but i did take some b-roll this is actually this is another first i've ever done at a winery i took video while we walked around how much i'm actually going to use we'll, we'll see but sure um so yeah i got to see that so kind of um i mean we kind of already hinted about it but kind of talk yeah, about yeah. Why, what that is really doing so we i mean we use traditional winemaking protocols mm -hmm. and steps here, methods. Uh, and then we use like postmodern methods of winemaking. And I would say Microox kind of falls into that postmodern. And essentially what it is, it's, it's just able to, you're able to control the amount of oxygen that you can apply to a red wine mm -hmm. um, to help integrate oak. In this case, we use a, 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 an oak adjunct. adjunct. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to say an alternative form, I guess it is. it's all oak. It's all oak, yeah. Yeah, and somebody at the symposium one time said, it's not an alternative, it's oak. I'm like, oh, yeah, but it's an alternative way to use oak? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I know, you know, it's semantics, I guess. <laughs> Adjunct. In this case, we use a chip, and it's the same. It, uh, and I was telling you earlier, this is it's almost oxymoronic, but it's the, it's the, um, it's the most expensive and the best oak chip, you know, available. But it makes a huge difference. It's all about it's all about consistency. Yeah. And and helping shape that product, knowing that each year you're gonna have a different product to work with. So why would you think applying the same amount of salt, you know, to a different dish is gonna be the right way to season that dish? Right. Yeah. So it's just like with our lime making, we can. Um, it's a little more control. A controlled way for us to shape wines and integrate um, our oak profile into that wine. Right. It also allows you to get a price point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because economics behind it, or uh, they are. They're, it's a it's a big motivational, you know, big motivation to use 
um, utilize microbes, but you can also you can do some damage to your wines if you're not using it right. Mm -hmm. So it's not like just like hey, go out there and buy a micro rocks, you're gonna save a lot of money. You know, micro rocks machine and some oak chips. It's like you know, you can still wreck your wine using it the wrong way. Right. So there's definitely a big a lot a lot of training that goes into using it right. And it took us over a decade to to really figure it out. But now that we we have it, we feel like we've got it figured out at least for our wines pretty good. Um, that helps bring, you know, helps us over deliver on that value I talked about earlier and our wines and keep our price points consistent and mm -hmm. not have to take big price increases, you know, yeah. um, every other year. So, uh, and that's, it's important, you know, that we were able to maintain price and product consistency that way. Yeah, I got the taste of uh, that Malbec. Right? Yeah, so there's a Malbec core shaping. That's kind of a, that's an interesting wine that you try because that's late, that's, you know, um, basically what we call a harmonization phase of micro mm -hmm. It's like at the late stage of its of that wine's life. Got to protect the chi, right? Yeah, protect <laughs> the chi. <laughs> I got to be careful because I don't know too much about like that. Yeah, lots of stuff. So neither do I. <laughs> I don't exist. Is about it. Yeah, just like I guess chakras, quoting chakras, else. whatever. Yeah, but it's you got to be careful. You can't. So you have to be real careful on not putting too a very low rate of of. Um, of micro -oxid oxygenation is occurring. Yeah. Versus strongly too. <laughs> yeah, you can't say oxidation because it's not. You don't, yeah. don't want to oxidize it. And we and we protect against that. I mean, we're using we use some sulfur dioxide in this case to protect against it. But we're also watching our dissolved oxygen levels, um, and we're we're just smelling for oxidation products. But everything's tracking along perfectly. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're doing it right, the wine absorbs all the oxygen you give it. And it helps shape the mouthfeel, and it helps integrate the, the wood, or it helps uh, kind of adjust the aromatics to be yeah. a little more open, you know, open up a little bit without being like totally just open and, and, and oxidized, I guess. Yeah. Everyone oxidized. Right. So, yeah, we try, you try to wine, um, you know, kind of the later stage of, of the mox phase, micro ox phase. And then, um, you know, if you come back ever, say in the fall months, you'll try some wines that are getting like a very aggressive amount of oxygen yeah. to help stabilize color. And actually we're looking for oxidation products, you know, during that phase to help, you know, just keep that color set and not be lost during the winemaking process. Yeah. So you guys might've just heard, I actually just finally turned the microphones on. <laughs> so I, I'm going to make, so I have, I have some tools at home. <laughs> I have tools at home like a winemaker does. <laughs> And I can hopefully make the audio sound really pretty decent and eliminate a lot of the, a lot of the echo. Um, I just now, because as I, I looked at it, I said, how long have you been doing this? Oh, it says zero. So from now on, the sound's going to be really good. <laughs> I saw good. that spark on your face. Yeah, so like, oh! I just well. had this thought of, uh, you know, that movie Wayne's World where there's no film in this camera. Yeah, no, <laughs> that red dot says we're recording, so we're good there. <laughs> but... Uh, Anyway, so I'm sorry about that. That's but okay. I think the audio will be good enough, but I'll I'll, I'll fix fix it and mix is what we call it. I'll, I'll it'll, it'll sound better than just straight like come off the phone. But now our audio is really good. Perfect. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm not gonna call it perfect because it's never <laughs> perfect. Anyway, um, so well, to yeah. summarize, we use traditional winemaking and postmodern winemaking post yeah. with micro -ox micro oxygenation being one of those postmodern tools right. that we use. Cool. Um, should we kind of taste some wines? I mean, we can kind of talk about some of the other stuff that uh, we, we, you know, uh, other, other other barrels we taste. But yeah, uh, uh, tasting the wines, this. we can actually dive more into the winemaking yeah. um, styles yeah, or exactly. techniques used. Yeah. So sure, let's do it. So we're going to start with uh, this one? Or yeah, I poured the 1836. Uh, let's start with the Pig Pool. Okay. I poured a 2018 Pig Pool Blanc. And this particular label is kind of our new wine club label. Okay. And um, this is only found at the winery. We made this is a micro batch of wine. Um, we actually did very pretty, you know, low in intervention winemaking. Um, we actually didn't even uh, find and find out a lot of the protein. So there's a little bit of a haze you can see okay. versus say the Polish yeah, 1836. Is. Yeah. So because it's it's small batch winemaking, you're limited as to what you can do. And so um, and this was like 50 something cases. This was very small. So I didn't really, I, I didn't go extreme in terms of um, finding or stabilizing. So it's, okay. um, yeah, so it will throw some haze and it may even throw uh, some tartrates. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so 
I think I've talked. But there's about nothing before. wrong with that. Yeah. Okay. So just what he's talking about is the, the thing is called like the ice crystals, and that's just a natural, which it can happen even if someone did fine and filter and yeah. It, it may not have been cold stabilized enough, but it can happen with white wines. Yep. In, in red wines, it's the stuff that shows up on the cap, the sediment, the yep. the, the cork, and it's totally it's not not it's not glass. Yeah, it's, it's not, not diamonds you. either. Not diamonds, yeah, wine diamonds. It's just yeah. a natural salt. Yeah, it it's usually tasteless. It just gives you a little grittiness that you can just you know run it through a. Um, it's usually at the tail end of the bottle that you get it anyways. So. Yeah, it can it can just kind of it can kind of just be a little uh, you know. Rough, yeah. yeah it just well, it doesn't it's kind of a gra grainy texture, yeah. I guess, at the very end. Or like, <laughs> but I always say, if you don't like it, just send the the end of the bottle to me. I'll I'll finish You'll it. You'll finish, you. yeah. <laughs> or or when you're sitting out on a deck in, in in the country and the fruit flies show up in your wine. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Oh yeah. <laughs> anyway, so let's get to this one. Sure. So there was, I feel like it's a little bit of, of kind of a. I had I can't remember last night at Pitbull Blanc, so I don't have a reference really of of what I should. Be yeah. smelling or tasting, but I feel like there's like a little herbaceousness in this thing. Yeah, there's you a know? little green character. Um, Pickpool Blanc is is one of the, I believe it's one of the approved Chateauneuf thirteen varieties that that's you know found in southern France. Depending how you want to count it. Sure. <laughs> obviously, it's a white white grape. Um, yeah. It's another one of those. I don't know if it's a loose translation. Pickpool may may mean lip stinger. So typically, the acidity mm. is fairly high or at least prominent on the palate and um, the the way we made this wine is kind of like the way we make our Sauvignon Blanc we do what's called a reductive winemaking method okay. so we try to protect it from oxygen so right. we talked about oxygen its importance earlier and we're only talking about red wines in this case I want to protect it because some you know some of the aromatics in this wine are very susceptible to being lost due to oxidation okay so this is a wine where it's like Keep the keep the SO, you know, keep the SO2 levels at a decent rate, say 20 parts per million, which is still low. World. Still low, yeah. <laughs> I mean that, that's that. I mean a lot of times that people really call that 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 finishing even like you said uh, minimal or low low, low intervention. intervention. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that is a 20 20 parts per million is considered can be considered that. Yeah, yeah. Try to pick this pick these grapes a little um, sooner. Don't let them hang too long. Mm -hmm. Keep your alcohols you know low to moderate. Um, retain natural acidity, keep the pH low if you can. Yeah. And that way you don't have to use much SO2. But also right, keep yeah. it on the leaves for a little bit, protect it, use your tools to protect this wine from, from oxidation, and then try to bottle it as soon as you can. Okay. So we typically, I think we bottled this one in February of this year. And sometimes I like to bottle these even sooner if I can. But try to keep it crisp and fruit forward and and knowing that this is a wine that'll be showing its best in the first, you know, twelve to eighteen months of its life. Yeah, and it's um, meant to be drunk young. You're not, not going to age this thing. No, yeah. it's a dry wine. It's got um, a. What I thought was interesting. This is the first time I've actually made this wine or even messed with these grapes. Um, I did notice, and it could just be this particular year or that particular vineyard, but the malic acid content was lower than I typically see in like a normal you know, a uh, white grape okay. cultivar grown out here. So I thought that was interesting. So there's malic acid can play a, a pretty big role in the acid profile on wines like this. And this one's lower than normal. And it didn't go through a malolactic. It may have gone through a slightly wild one. Yeah. You know, maybe it was it had some lactobacillus or some kind of lactic acid bacteria with it. Yeah. And um, and then we when we added some SO2, it kind of stopped it. But it was kind of low from the get-go. So I just think it's just like a native... A natural feature, right, for this particular grape, and thus the wine. So it doesn't acid, feel like a low acid wine, though. No, I think the acid you're tasting is the tartaric acid instead okay. of the acid. Yeah, so. yeah. But I just thought that was interesting. So that being said, this um, there's actually a little bit of a, like a nuttiness from the time on leaves. Mm -hmm. But there's definitely like a like an apple component going on, mm -hmm. and then of course the acidity that's there. The reason I brought that up is because typically the malic acid, this wine does not go through ML, right? No mallow, and um, you know having that tart, that green apple kind of acid from the malic is something I was a signature I was going for. I just said notice during you know some of the analysis I was like, wow, that's that's abnormally low right <laughs> on that particular acid yeah yeah that i would uh, expect from a wine 
you know, um, like this. So now with this this one, and and during during the symposium, uh, it was brought up um, that as a very broad generalization with Texas wine that um, we can struggle with acid. Yeah. Um, but this one seems like it, it was. There was this one came in pretty good, right? It did. We did um, add a little tartaric acid to it, yeah. but it wasn't like uh, it didn't come in at a four point oh pH. Right. It was and, close to that know, mid range per liter. Yeah, I think when we brought this in, it was, it was hovering more around like three four, which I was pretty impressed with. Okay. Um, and the ripeness was a little higher than we expected on the brick scale. It was closer to like twenty two and a half. 23. This okay. is a wine I'd probably want to bring in like 21, maybe. I want to keep it like 12% alcohol mm -hmm. if I can. Yeah. 12 to 13 tops, you know, and just, and it's really have that. Um, I want a lot of acidity. I want a lot of crispness and just, right. you know, mouthwatering acidity to, um, you know, to pair really well with any kind of cheese or food that you're going to serve yeah. this with. But I want, that's the traditional, that's like the benchmark, you know, the wine that I use the benchmark you know for style that's what i had you know i was like wow you know it's like electric with acidity right. and just crisp um kind of minerality going on so yeah this is um not too there's probably had a little bit maybe a gram per liter of tartaric acid added to it but um yeah it didn't have to mess with it too much just um, we use it and we used a commercial form a commercial yeast to help um showcase those ex express you know make the aromatics just a little more yeah. explosive and then we did a little Lee's aging um, to kind of help soften some of that. We don't want too harsh of an acidity, soften it a little bit, but also protect the wine because it was a small batch right. of wine um, without having to use too much sulfur dioxide. Yeah. So, no, this is really nice. I mean, it's got that refresh. It's refreshing. It's crisp. Um, I like that. You know, I I like having that little bit of herbaceousness on it. It's not like it's not like getting that like a Sauvignon Blanc that's like like really like with all those pyrazines and which I love, but um, I mean at least with if it's done in the right way and it's in, it's supposed to be there. Um, but uh, you know I like that it it's got almost a bit even on the palate a little bit of savoriness to it, but like that yeah. green apple like almost like a green apple candy, but like you, you threw some like. I don't know, like some oregano on it or something like that. Yeah. Not quite oregano, but but there was something that's like gives a little bit of savoriness to it. Yeah, it's almost like a mintiness or something yeah. like light in the background. Yeah. But yeah, I also like, I, did, I was noticing just on that last sip, there's almost like a little chalkiness, which is yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, that too. So, yeah. But yeah, it's an interesting uh, variety. It does pretty well out here. The growers seem to like it. Yeah. It's becoming a component. Um, it's going to be a blending component as well for us going forward for the next wine we're going to taste, which is right. the 1836 white. Um, but yeah, we, we like it. We're going to do it again this next year. Okay. Um, maybe increase the production a little bit. Yeah, right. <laughs> maybe go from micro to just to, small. To, <laughs> to, to, yeah, mini. <laughs> yeah, mini. <laughs> mini yeah, production. The, whatever the next step is. Yeah. Well, uh, let's get into 1836. Uh, this is a wine that I've actually had on the show yeah. uh, a couple times, and I've always enjoyed it. So, give us a little history about about it. And for those for those of who are not from Texas or never lived in Texas, we'll explain what 1836 means. Sure. <laughs> yeah, 1836 was the year that the um, I think I believe Texas gained independence from Mexico, mm -hmm. and the wine is commemorating the spirit of those fought during the Battle of San Jacinto and um, San Jacinto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> San Jack. San Jack. Yeah, San Jack. <laughs> and, uh, which I can say that, I've driven by the battlefield many a times. Yeah. Anyways, this wine kind of commemorates the, um, you know, the spirit of, of you know, the pioneers mm -hmm. um, in Texas. And um, it's a roan, it's a white roan blend. So the base wine is a Marsan, um, Marsan, Viognier, Roussan. Mm -hmm. um, all, vinified separately and then blended later on okay and um and they all it's an interesting wine they all bring they bring different characteristics to the to the glass and this is most of the components were were derived were sourced from the high plains area the lubbock area mm -hmm. uh, the viognier was sourced from a vineyard in far west texas near el paso okay um and a little used to be called the montsec vineyard Right, so I was going to say, was it that one that's yeah. like, like almost it's like up, that mountain? It's almost west up. of Guadalupe Peak, yeah. It's yeah. one of the only vineyards that I know of in the state that's got a mountain in the background or close yeah. to, you know, kind of in some foothills. Right, yeah. <laughs> but um, 
Yeah, this wine is 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 big and bold. Um, it's I wanted to I didn't want to make it too, you know, Rhone esque where it's like no acidity. So um, that's why I identified everything separately, kind of brought all those components and tried to make a nice balanced wine from it. So okay, uh, this is an on premise brand, restaurant only. Uh, of course, you can buy it at the winery too, but. Um, the main I- idea behind it is to have it kind of have a savory effect, um, serve it at the table. You know, it's going to enhance the meal. Yeah. The, the food will enhance the wine and vice versa. Right. And um, yeah, let's just get into the glass. Enough talk, yeah. I guess. Primarily Roussan, or I'm sorry, Marsan, about 50%. And then we've got a big chunk of Viognier in there, about 40%. And then the balance being uh, Roussan. I'm probably off by a few percentages there. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll get enough. Yeah. It's evolved. This used yeah. to be a um, a blend that was still Rhone based, Rhone white uh, variety based, and then we blended in some Chardonnay. I think on the earlier vintages. Okay. Um, but I really wanted to make it a Rhone, you know, white Rhone blend. Yeah. And it's just trying to find those particular varieties, um, at least in three of them, even. You know, mm-hmm. on the high plains is tough because they're they're sought after big time. Right. Yeah. And so um, I know like, a lot of people are making even just like straight like single variety like you know Marsans, more so than Roussan. But there's I can't remember who it was. I, I know I'm almost positive it was a Texas winemaker. Um, another winery that they want to focus on Roussan versus Marsan. Yeah. They they like it better for whatever the reason. I don't remember what it is. Um, so with the. Uh, we talked about vinifying separately, and but you want to keep the acid level high higher. Um, if you had if you had co-fermented this with with the VNA pull, would it would it like kind of suck some of the acid down because it's low acid grape typically, or is this or is this more of a higher because of where it's being grown? Yeah. I know naturally it's a low acid grape, so if I call high acid on blind, I better not put VNA in my initial. Yeah, <laughs> typically um, the. So first off, the Roussan is not going to be your acid supplier. <laughs> it's, the, it's the Marsan, right? It's usually the Marsan and the Viognier. Okay. And in this particular case, it was the Marsan. Okay. And so we picked it a little, um, not underripe, but we didn't pick it as ripe as we picked the Viognier and the Roussan. Okay. The Roussan is almost like you pick it like a red wine. I mean, it's just it like almost, it's a white grape that wants to be a red grape. It's okay. really, it can... Depending on how much time, it can really throw a, kind of a phenolic character to the wine, like a lot of texture derived from almost like a, tan, a tannin um, from, okay. the, from the skins itself. Um, it needs to get really ripe to kind of get to start getting some of these like um, tropical um, or, or strong, like say, um, stone fruit characteristics. If not, it can kind of stay green. You can get kind of a herbal mm-hmm. character from it if it doesn't get ripe enough. Um, so the the, Mar- the Roussan, I was like, let's get that ripe. You know, that'll be our texture. That'll be our, our body behind this wine, kind of the meat behind it. Okay. But it's not going to be. It's going to be a little bit contributor to the riper, you know, um, tropical and, and stone fruit character to the wine. Um, but it's not going to be the the core in terms of like having that acidity and finesse. That's going to be the Marsan component. Okay. And we found a site up here in the high plains um, that's. There's Marsan planted on a lot of clay, and it does. Uh, it makes a really it's kind of elegant white wine. It's not super aromatic, but it's just got this like elegant core to it that um, I really I'm really digging. Yeah, and I think that's what brings kind of the elegance to this wine. Uh, the Viognier brings that fleshy, just uh, peachy character. Yeah, um, not a big acid supplier. Of course, we didn't put we didn't put the Viognier through malolactic, so it did retain some acidity. Okay. Uh, more so than it normally can. Okay. Um, it also brings more some alcohol and some weight. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, you know, to bring them all those together and find in that right blend percentage, uh, we felt we made a nice complete wine here. Um, yeah, this is um, it's for me. It's been a consistently really good wine that the, the over the years I've had it, um, and uh, I've really enjoyed it. And really, like the last couple of years of, of, of getting these samples um, has been has been really nice because um, I really only knew uh, Yano as more of the the really entry level wines. And there's nothing wrong with those wines, but it's not necessarily my palate. Yeah. Not necessarily the ones that I'm going to seek out, but um, but there's definitely some entry level wines that are, that are really nice, you know, from mm-hmm. from all over. Um, and so getting 
like the 1836 and some of the other stuff that I've had, you know, really it's like, wow, you know, this is good stuff. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, this is actually one of the reasons why when I said I'm going to come out to West Texas, I was like, hey, Yana's Town makes some legit wine, you know, so I want to go visit where I know people are making excellent quality wine. Yeah. You know, sometimes well, it came out. Yeah. Sometimes when I do these winery visits, sometimes it really is like a rolling of the dice. I, I've yeah. not had the wines ever. So I'm kind of like, man, I really hope when it gets down to this part of what my visit that I'm like, yes, I like the wine instead of like, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I got to find something nice to say, which I mean, if you, people are watching the, my show for quite a while now, um, if I don't personally like the wine, I try to at least, at least speak to if the wine make the wine was made at least well yeah if it was a well-made wine just not my not my style or if i feel like there's definitely a market for that wine at least at least highlight those aspects of the wine so that it's you know i'm not like panning the wine yeah. because you know what there's a we talked about it off camera we think we kind of alluded to it here there's a wine for everybody out there mm -hmm. you know just because you know you and i disagree on or agree on something and somebody else likes something different doesn't mean it's a bad wine if yeah. everything's made well if we can at least agree there's no faults to it and and you know it tastes the way it's supposed to taste then who cares if somebody you know likes super expensive or super super inexpensive i try to use avoid the use word cheap yeah um, because it has such a negative connotation even though i don't necessarily view that in a negative way all the time mm -hmm. so yeah but this, this has been one of my favorites that that I've, I've had over the years and i always look forward to to having it and i'm glad this you is try just the nice. 2017 yeah. vintage yeah yeah i mean there's a lot of wines that i make that um that I don't drink, you know, they're not, they're just not my preferred style, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to put my best effort into, into making it or maintaining that particular uh, consistency that we need. Because there's a ton, there's a lot of people out there that do look forward to that particular wine or that style. And um, I don't want to let them down. I mean, yeah, I mean, of course I want to keep my job too, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that, that, that thing is just anything. I think just... anyone dr drinking wine, I want to support wine mm -hmm. and it's something that, you know, is still it's gaining traction more and more every year. And more importantly, I want to support wine at the dinner table. Yeah, I mean, I drink wine every single day. You know, and and it's most of the time it's just at dinner. You know, yeah. it's a glass at dinner. And um, and I want my kids growing up with that. You know, this like almost European yeah healthy table. respect. <laughs> a, you know, like respect a healthy respect it. for for what what for we wine. have here with wine. Yeah. You know, um, especially in a formerly dry. Area. Yeah. In a beer <laughs> so, drinking state. <laughs> real quick. Yeah. Real quick. Uh, if, for non Texans, and I'm not sure about the rest of the country, dry just means you can't sell alcohol unless it's a private club. Yep. And you have to, so like if you go to like to a Friday's, you have to join, you have to get a little like membership, costs like two bucks. Well, I don't know how much it costs. I haven't, done, I haven't been in a dry county in a long time. It was a totally new thing for me when I moved here. Yeah. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Well, if you go up to Lufkin, and Nacogdoches is no. Lufkin's dry, or they were. I'm not. If they're still dry, but in my, okay. in my previous life of restaurant, not restaurant, ma magazines, mm -hmm. and I lived in Houston. Uh, I go up to Lufkin. I had there was a, like a Chili's there, and I had to like buy like a, a yearly membership for like two bucks or three bucks, so I could order alcohol. So you are you are a, a member of a private club. It's yeah, just like not being able to buy liquor on Sundays in Texas, or being able to buy any alcohol before noon. Um, it's the last remnants of our blue laws, which, That's right. you know, everybody had, you know, a lot of states still have their blue laws in effect. I can remember growing up as a kid, there'd be entire aisles of grocery stores just roped off. You couldn't go buy because there was like one or two things on that aisle that you couldn't buy on a Sunday. Yeah. And these were like essentials. These were not like, it wasn't liquor or beer or wine. It was like stuff you, you would never think you, you couldn't buy. It was kind of weird, but anyway, wine's beautiful. And, uh. Is our spit bucket doing? <laughs> it's good. It's good. While you're getting to pour that. That's right. So I, a uh, friend of mine and I, back in my Houston days, he lives in Beaumont. I don't know if he's still there anymore. I lost track of him. We went to a South African wine tasting at once. And nobody spit, but they dumped. And um, we decided to try the dump bucket. <laughs> it was, yeah. 
Not a good choice. <laughs> I don't know. We, we yeah, we definitely grossed out there with people at the table. <laughs> It's like but, lose friends and not influence people. <laughs> well, I wasn't from Beaumont, so I wasn't worried about it if if, if uh, I if I if they you know thought I was uncouth and all that. I was never going to see them again. Who knows? So just, Maybe one of them was watching this now. It's like that was that guy. Yeah, that's right. I've been looking for you, man. All right, all right. I just poured us another on-premise brand, which okay. is restaurant only, and this is our Montestella uh, rosé. This is a rosé that's uh, comprised of uh, Carignan. Uh, Senso, Grenache, and Morbid. Okay. And um, which I think, you know, blended rosés typically, they make a, I mean, they usually make the best rosés. Yeah. I mean, that's Nothing against all the rosé of Pinot Noir out there. Yeah, but I think, I think that's what the public is used to is these, these, these blends, uh, especially like, uh, especially a French, you know, French varieties being blended, whether it's Provence or just Southern, Southern France. And that's what we're going for here. So we make it in a reductive way. Um, so limiting the oxygen exposure to this wine. I almost basically make this wine like I make our Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. So really um, protect it from the get-go. You know, as soon as they're harvesting the grapes, we're protecting it from oxygen. Put it in our closed configuration press. Um, ferment with one of these yeasts. Um, and they're kind of a hybrid yeast that we use and they help express um, these these aromatic compounds that are found yeah. in these grapes. Uh, and then we try to bottle it as soon as possible. So there's really not much time on the lees. You know, in fact, we try to get it off the lees. And lees are all the dead yeast cells and um, just solids that are found at the bottom of the tank. They right. can contribute to a wine or they can detract some, you know, depending on the, the style of wine. And we try to get it off that those solids. And then um, clean it up and get it in the bottle as quick as possible. So for, yeah. we bottled this wine like December following the harvest. So before the new year. And that's okay. typically, and these were har- grapes that were harvested, you know, August and maybe a few in September. Um, so we, um, we blend early on. You know, we, some of these we had to vinify separately because, it's, you know, the components were picked a little bit later. Right. Yeah, but you can't we, we, have grapes just sitting around. Exactly. I mean, you could. You freeze them. We're not freezing, but you can. Yeah. You know, um, it's yeah, it's but difficult it's, but, to do that. But then it's kind of a pain, right? And then you're basically making a red wine. You miss out. This is like the natural yeah. color. We didn't mess with the color at all. This is yeah. like the color we got by picking it as a rosé variety. So basically picking it like you would a white wine. So picking it a little less ripe. Okay. Um, kind of protecting your acidity. You know, we want you know lower pH, higher acidity. Um, this is just the color extracted during time on the skins from transit from the vineyard to the press that's wow it, man. yeah and so some so of our vineyards are a little bit further which actually benefited this so we get a little more time on the skin so mostly a couple hours maybe yeah usually about a one of them's about a six hour trek okay in the, the back of a truck um the other one was a local you know maybe an hour okay you know um so um this is just you know the color we got rolled with it didn't yeah. enhance it in any way so yeah. Anyways, fruity. But this is also a rosé. This is 2017 vintage. Mm-hmm. So this has some time in the bottle to evolve. So it's actually less fruity than it was. It's starting to get like a little savory component. Yeah. I, 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 it's really got that, you know. Um, it's For me, I get more of the watermelon on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's definitely got like a, a touch of savoriness to it it's not it's not like a it's not like some rosés where they're 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 technically dry <clears throat> but yeah. they they have so much fruit it really tastes like sweet this is you know i'm gonna call it tart watermelon but it's not as like it just it's not like i just bit into a like a, 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 a you know piece of watermelon yeah you know it's it's I'm like a hint of it and uh I do even get a little bit of minerality, maybe a touch of salinity out of it. Yeah, there's like you a know? touch of saltiness, which I like. Yeah. And that's probably, so the vineyard, um, and this is actually, this label is, um, it's a drawing, it's a sketch of the mountain of that range. Mountain? Yeah, yeah. you would see, and there's like Mount Guadalupe Peak right there, which is the tallest mountain in Texas in the background. And that particular vineyard, actually, there is a higher level of salinity in the soils. And they do, the grapes do you know, mm-hmm. or the plants, the vines take up that salinity and they, and they end up into the grapes and then thus into the wine. So the yeah. more bed and the Grenache component are what actually is bringing that little bit of salt, okay. that salinity, which is, you don't find that on 
any of our High Plains wines. Um, really, that's a very unique vineyard characteristic for that particular place. Okay. So it's like the terroir of that vineyard is to add a little saltiness. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, so with this being a 17, um, I mean, to me, to yeah, me it's typical for a rosé, you know, typically you're pouring, you know, rosés are like what, get them sold that year after yeah. the vintage. Yeah. I, I just on. don't, I just, I mean, I know rosés are meant to be drunk young. You're not, they're not really meant to be aged. But to me, even, you know, we're, we're almost in June right now. And, I don't think it's necessarily bad to be drinking a 17 rosé because, I mean, like you bottled it, you said December, right? Yeah. You know, and some rosés aren't bottled till the following year. So it's mm -hmm. not even, it's barely, you know, it's about a year and a half since it's been bottled. I don't think it's necessarily that bad. I mean, I've, I've had people kind of go, well, I want I want the 18 on something. I'm like, it's not even out yet. Maybe the rosés are, but. Yeah. Well, that's why I you know, this. I yeah. want to show that some rosés can hold up. Yeah. <laughs> And I know we're in the era of rosé that's everywhere, yeah. right? And it doesn't always have to be the newest vintage. So, we, of course, we you know we do release a um, on our regular Yano brand. You know, we are pushing hard for that. You know, go, fitting into that style, right? Uh, fresh and fruity, and and just drink probably showing its best young. But this particular, um, you know, we, we we wouldn't we don't mind a little savory element. Yeah. Because this is a wine that's you know sold in restaurants. It's gonna be paired with food. And in fact, I had this. We had this a few weeks ago at dinner um, at a tapas bar, uh, a tapas restaurant in town. And it was beautiful. I mean, it just like paired almost with everything that was put out there. Right. And like this bottle went quick. It was just drinking, you know, just beautifully. And so, um, and I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but that's something I like to do with these wines. I want I want them to be at the table, and I want them to enhance the dining experience. So I go into making these wines, you know, to be you know have a little more acidity, have a little more, you know, um, just you know balancing factor when it, knowing that it you know pairing it with food it'll show best. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean when when so I would do you like a pistachio now. <laughs> yeah, why not? Let's do a pistachio because I, I think I think it actually go really well. Yeah, this for the record, this just happened to be the food we brought with us because we're, we're it's, going it's, into it's lunchtime. Get, it's getting close to lunchtime, so <laughs> let's see if uh, if it does anything. Yeah, <laughs> here we go. Yeah, when I when I do reviews, you know, sometimes wines are just delicious on their own. And you don't need any food, but there are some wines I'm like, man, if I could pair this with, you know, when I pick a pick a food, it'd be great. Who knows if pistachios are the right food for this wine? <laughs> I don't know. I kind of think. A flavor profile of pistachio, and well, pistachios aren't really high salinity. There's still there's still a bit of that to it. Beautiful, great, great pairing. <laughs> they did actually. I the like fat, it. The fattiness, the, the nut. Yeah, yeah. Know, the, the fat, like actually, the the wine just like because the acidity down helps with it. that. You know, yeah. I mean, I I know everybody likes to talk about tannin and fat, but acid and fat also do the same thing. That's why I like white wines can go really great with cheeses. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just a different it's a different component of, of the of the of the of the wine that's interacting with with the fat. And I can't remember. I, I I saw someone talk about white wine and the type of cheese that you're doing it, whether it's um, uh, sheep milk, uh, sheep or cows. goat or cow milk. Uh, it goes better. But they also were talking about how um, – Or water buffalo. Water buffalo, yeah. <laughs> There's something about the fat and, and the, where it came from and the type of component. and it, 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 White wine tend, can be better with it than red wine. That, that's what I was trying to get at. That the acid does better oh, yeah. with certain types of fats versus tannin. I mean I honestly – white wine gets – just in general, you know, most white wine is not paired with red meats, right? Well, I would make Correct. a case that one of the best pairings I've ever had – has been a Sauvignon Blanc with like an herb roasted le like leg of lamb. Okay, well I could see that totally. Yeah, I mean, but that's like I mean, it makes sense if you think about it. But was it New Zealand lamb too? It was. Ah, yeah. oh, see, <laughs> it was may it New have Zealand? been in New Zealand <laughs> Sauvignon Blanc too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I I I I, I remember once I tell the story, um, one of the restaurants I used to work at, um. It was we didn't have like some amazing wine list. It was you know it was a national brand, and then they, they just had like a very basic wine list. But you had wine. Mm -hmm. People wanted wine, and this is one of the regulars. She used to come in, and she used to drink. Uh, she used to get the steak. It was like a filet, and they had like a 
They had a house. They had a Maison butter. So there was a butter. Um, I think it had like, I think it had like, you know, um, white wine in it and garlic and other stuff. But she used to always get a Pinot Grigio. Mm -hmm. And even back then, you know, I was the wine guy at this place. Um, she was like, I bet you think that I, you know, I'm doing something wrong. I was like, do you like it? She's like, yeah. I said, well, I see, you know, I see why you're doing it because I think the Pinot Grigio goes really well with the butter. You know, helps with helps with that. She was like, oh, because this probably for her, that's what really enhanced the flavor of the steak is not just is that the wine paired well with that whole combination. And yeah, and it was filet. So filet doesn't have a high fat content anyway. Yeah. So you can get away with lighter wines with fillets, whereas with ribeyes, you probably want things with you know more structure to it, like more heavier, heavier red wines. It's almost like pairing the, you know, if it's a delicate dish, maybe a more delicate wine, mm -hmm. whether it's white or red or rosé or right. whatever. And the same thing, if it's a heavy, heavy meal, heavy dish, heavy sauce, pair it with a heavier wine. Yeah, so. and it could be it could be like you know a, 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 a oaky, buttery Chardonnay. Absolutely. Because it's going to stand up to the with dish. A nice buttery steak. I mean, what's wrong yeah, with that? Exactly. I mean, you could, it's going to stand up to it's going to stand up to the dish if you use a heavier red wine. I mean, heavier white wine. So, yeah, just we have the rules and they're great guidelines, but sometimes you can go outside the box and sometimes and you should have great break them. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and you're going to get some really cool things happen. So yeah. All right. So All right, we I've heard us. Moving on, yeah, I poured uh, another one of our newer wine club label, newer releases actually, for okay. the wine club under the new label. And this is a Cabernet Franc, and um, I've got the vineyard designates on the back. It's a, it's a, it's actually a blend of uh, Cabernet Franc and some Merlot. It's okay. About eighty twenty. And the Cabernet Franc came from Ready Vineyards, which okay. is in. Um, Another well Terry known, County. yeah. Another well known vineyard people, which uh, I, I'm, I'm not seeing in this trip, but at yep. some point I will make it out and see them too. Yeah, one of the bigger vineyards in the state too. Yeah, uh, consistent producer. And then we got some Merlot from the Newsom Vineyards, which is what we blended in here. And I guarantee you, I saw those grapes yesterday. There you go. <laughs> because Neil and I went through basically. I want to say all of his vineyards. It felt like it was all of them. We went to three different sites. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the biggest one was the one by the house. And there was a whole bunch of stuff there. Over by and, the barnery. Know, yeah. I mean, we got, I mean, I, I saw I saw the grapes that are used in lots of other wineries, you know, um, and the stuff is. But you know, and I'll talk about that in a couple of weeks, you know. But um, it was kind of prefaced. You, you know, every episode you should watch. But that should be really cool. Just from a vineyard, just from a farmer's perspective of what, what's going on. And, and that's what I'm really excited about doing. Because um, I've, I've never actually gone to just a vineyard. Yeah. It's always been, if it's been vineyards on site with a winery, then yes, someone's there. You know, uh, when I went to Benziger, it was the viticulturist that, mm -hmm. that, that took me on the tour. So it was like I could pick his brain. You know, like, oh, well, he was able to tell you about the vineyard. Yeah. 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 So anyway. Well, that's, that's uh, unique. I mean, Texas... Is, is actually pretty traditional New World, um, I guess, when it comes to supplier of grapes and producer of wine, mm -hmm. there's that separation. Right. That's pretty traditional in the New World, and we're, we're pretty much like that in the state of Texas. There's right. There's that separation between the supplier of grapes and the uh, producer of wine. But this is cool. You're, you've came to the area where you know most of the grapes are grown, mm -hmm. and so... Um, Get to go visit the uh, the farming side of it, and that has always been my goal. Whenever I was going to come out here, was I was like, and and I've I've heard a lot of names over the years, but the 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 person that we're going to interview in a couple of weeks or tomorrow, um, you know, his name has come up probably more than anyone else. Um, if he's also been doing it for a while, and again, we'll get into that. In, in that episode, because I don't want to like take away too much or ahead of time, but yep. because since we, he and I got to hang out yesterday, I basically did the pre-interview yesterday. Um, you know, after spending a couple, well, I spent quite a bit of time with with them. Yeah. But um, it's been it was eye-opening just coming out here um, again, being able to come here, and also going to my next appointment, which is next week's uh, episode. Um, you know, and 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 going to. Some pioneers. of the wineries. These are the pioneers. Yeah, you know, these are the pioneers. Of the, wine, of you the know, Texas wine grape industry. Yeah, so. and I basically have, that's who I've, I'm visiting this, this visit. Unfortunately, the other people I, I contacted never got back to me. So, 
That's okay. So you're I winging mean, it a little bit. We're winging it a little bit, you know. Hey, uh, you know, I, I, hey, I already told you on Friday, so the third day of the trip, I'm going to make it make a special trip, and we'll get to that another time. So hey, this, this guy, your wine, Cabernet Franc, uh, first of all, just Cabernet Franc for me is, is a grape I really enjoy, um, uh, just as a, a grape on its own. Um, yeah. Being, being, you know, I don't know if it's the mom or the dad of Cabernet Sauvignon. I don't know which one it is, but it's one of the parents. Yes, <laughs> it's one of the parents. You know, I, I love, I love. So this is my version of the story. Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc got busy in the vineyard one day, and they made Cab Cabernet Franc and Cabernet and Sauvignon Blanc got busy in the vineyards one day, and they made Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> and someone goes, "What?" Like it really was true, and it was in the name the whole time. And it took what, like the late nineties, for someone to figure that out, like DNA testing. Yeah, they did a lot of that at University of California, Davis. Yeah, and it was uh, Carol Meredith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to interview – Carol, if you ever watch my stuff, I want to interview you because you're awesome. <laughs> it would be a much more interview, better interview than you – know, a more interesting interview than this and, one. So. And um, one of my favorite quotes from her is in the Psalm movie, the first Psalm movie. So I won't use her quote. You could probably find it. So – there's more – well, there's more BS than anything else. You know, the wine, it was the basically, the, basically the, the, the wine industry has a lot of just BS. She said it a little more colorfully than I did. <laughs> <laughs> but that's her opinion. And uh, I think I think a lot of I think a lot of injuries a lot of industries have as much. Well, we got to sell it, right? You we know? got to sell it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we got to sell it. But I mean. So this morning's discussion about uh, pricing of wines, mm -hmm. um, uh, just to give the short, uh, the short answer, the short story on it was that you know just like any other product, there's there's you know lots of things that go into pricing, and one of the things can be brand. Yeah. If the brand's a hot brand or the person's like the it the in thing, then well, guess what? That product just went, up, went and, up went up and it may not be any better than something that's half or a fraction of the price. Yeah. You know, but and 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 wine is can be one of those things. You know, it's not the only product that has that type of pricing, like, well, why is that thing like five thousand dollars? And this one's only fifty bucks, so I don't taste the difference. Yeah. Some yeah. of it's supply and demand. Some of it's just like yeah. the brand cachet. Yeah, there's exactly. a lot of different factors. Um, yeah, and then some of it just gets into that luxury world where um, I mean it's sold at auction now, and then the, the the original price is just like you know magnitude less mm -hmm. than what what their people are buying it for. But yeah, it's just uh, fermented grapes. <laughs> Meant to be drank at the table. Fermented grapes. My my really crude crude explanation is grape juice and with vodka in it. Yeah, it but makes you it makes you feel pretty good. It makes too. Feel I like good. That, and and so this wine makes me feel pretty good. I mean, I like it. Um, it's got some really great uh, red, a lot of more red and a little bit of black fruit in it. Yeah. Um, Less you know. herbaceous than typical Cabernet. Franc. Right. Well, and and actually. Since I did talk to a farmer yesterday, yeah, <laughs> and we talked about stuff. I don't want to like seal too much, but we we talked about basically that um, we're able to. Uh, you can control that herbaceousness here. Yeah, you can. I mean, but they also can do that in a lot of other places. It's not the they're not unique that you can you can make sure things get to a certain ripeness level, or or you can do stuff vineyard management to ensure that especially a grape like Cap Franc you you can eliminate Absolutely. the herbaceousness um, that's early work usually in the vineyard yeah after you set your crop yeah, yeah. basically use your canopy management yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yep um, so uh, and we did talk about that and and we'll go more in depth on that interview because there's some stuff that he does in the vineyards uh, uh, that we talked about which was really eye-opening that I don't ever I've never actually been shown or seen even with all the times I've been in vineyards. So, mm -hmm. um, but on this wine, it's really got all that great fruit to it. Um, you know, I really like uh, I like the structure on it. The, the the tannins are not aggressive. Um, you know, you're not. I don't feel like it's like totally drying my mouth out. Yeah. Um, it's it's. I wouldn't say call it juicy, but it's it, there's a delicious factor to it. You know. Cool. And yeah. So we went for mainly. Um, Kind of eliminating some of those pyrazines through um, through ripening. Yeah, um, a little more ripening than I typically would um, would go for. You know, and this is clocking in at like fifteen percent alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's carrying the alcohol pretty well, 
but um, that's one way, like we just talked about, one way of eliminating the, the green factor, the pyrazines. Yeah. And so that's what we're going for. We're, we're going for look fruit forward. We're going for um, kind of texture, the texture being um, kind of established, you know, through extended ripening um, instead of like manipulating the tannins, forming the tannins in the winemaking process. Because we yeah. ended up bottling this, you know, the, the summer after the vintage. Okay. Um, so we, we, we felt that um, blending in some Merlot would help um, kind of add, add some structure from what we lost by having that extended um, ripening with the Cabernet Franc. Um, add the structure and then we put it in neutral barrels. Yeah. So, which is funny because I almost get like a little vanilla character. <laughs> yeah. Which actually, we, we didn't really talk. We didn't talk about that. But in the in in the, you know, in the winery, we talked about how you te you do use a lot of you know used barrels. You're not really oh, yeah. you know, you're so, really um, not using a lot of new stuff. You, it's very it's it's very limited. Yes. So yeah. for predominant most of what we do, um, how we integrate our new oak is through oak chips. Mm -hmm. um, and they're high quality. I know it's hard to say oak chips and people are like, oh, that guy's cheap. But no, really, I mean, these are this is the same form of oak that you're, that's uh, the same staves that are being cured outdoors for, yeah. you know, for thousand dollar barrels. You know, they go into making the humble chip and, um, and just using the best chips, um, Best chips for our wine. Yeah, I, mean, I have to say that because I, there's probably a best chip for someone else's wine. Right. But using it in conjunction with you know this new technology, these new tools that are available with the microox, you know we can we can integrate that um, that oak profile better on batch by batch basis uh, of our wines. Yeah, if that's not saying that we don't use traditional winemaking techniques. Right, you do. You know, with with new oak, you know, um, with uh, you know just using a you know, traditional format where we go straight from alcoholic fermentation mal and then malactic in the barrel and it just stays in the barrel. Yeah. Okay. But we also, so on the, on the flip side, um, after we, we integrate, after you use the micro ox and the stainless steel, you know, uh, and, the, and the oak chips, we'll put it down to neutral barrels, neutral, you know, small oak barrels or, or mm -hmm. the punchins and yeah. let the wine breathe and let it complex. And sometimes a little Brett gets it integrated in and, and we have a more complex product from it. Um, but really it's just letting it, you know, just do its natural wine thing. Use that traditional, uh, right. winemaking method to kind of help complete the wine. So it's a mix of, 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 uh, new technology and, and tried and true traditional winemaking. Yeah. Which, it's, um, it's part of the recipe, right? You know, yeah, it's, it's, you know, you're using a certain spice and somebody else uses some other spice and yeah. you're at the end result, you're still getting something that's going to taste great. Right. Yeah. You know, and if you did like, I, you know. We'll use this wine for example. I don't know how much of, of postmodern and, and traditional you're using on this wine. It's like eighty twenty traditional to postmodern. Yeah. So so let's say <laughs> if I remember correctly. So let, let's say this was the other way. Let's say it was mostly postmodern, right? And yeah. you said, well, I'm just going to go one hundred percent traditional. We're going to throw some new French oak or even new American oak yeah. on this. I would imagine that the bottle cost could at least double, maybe triple. Depending, well, it depends on whether you use American or French, it could, it and might. how long you're going to age it. I mean, there's there's time. Time is money too. Well, we'd have yeah. Here we'd think about where we're going, how we're going to sell the wine. Yeah. So, and that would factor in um, where we're sourcing the fruit from, and then how we'd make it. Probably right. knowing that this is sold through the tasting room, um, and and then also factoring in the say the the cost of the fruit, um, yeah, plus the wine making. I mean, this is like a 20, I think a $25 bottle. Yeah. And that's about almost as expensive, like the most expensive we get around here. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we thought it was a, we thought it was, um, we didn't think that was overdoing it. Right. Know, price point. It's a very, you know, this is a wine that you can't find anywhere else. Um, it's the only at the wine. <laughs> good. Yeah. I saw, I was, I was like, what? Did it so work? real quick, um, so this is the first time I've used the app since Germany, and uh, everything's working. So I was kind of worried about that. Yeah, but anyway, so but for uh, a unique wine that you can't find yeah. anywhere else, we thought that was a good price point right, for it. Yeah, but this is yeah mainly we use the the postmodern winemaking techniques, the microox, very early on, you know, before we even blended, and I think it was only used on the merlot you know component of this wine, and. Um, and that was um, just using be between the alcoholic fermentation and the malolactic fermentation. We applied 
high rates of, of oxygen, right? Um, which you can use. You don't even need to have a microox machine to do it. You can just use like a lot of racking or pumping over. Right. It's just aeration. Another, it's another way to do it, but it's more like a big. It's more precise. Burst. Yeah, I think yeah. it's more precise, and you're getting you're getting you're applying the gas that you want. To, you know, so you mm -hmm. need to be applying the most functional gas, the oxygen, right. um, that does the that allows you to help stabilize your wine. Um, anyways, so this is mainly traditional winemaking, but yeah. just wanting to showcase the fruit, showcase what we did, what was done in the vineyard, and the and the choices we you know uh, were, that were made, um, you know, for picking the picking strategies, um, and the traditional winemaking, just showcasing that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. unique wine you can't really find nice. anywhere yeah. else in the world. Yeah. <laughs> really nice. So that's fun, and we may never do that again. I don't know. That's a fun part to of follow your lead and Some do these, that. Yeah, it's, 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 this is starting to get a little bit too unwieldy to, especially to bring it over my. Yeah, Mark my, said, my, he, Mark said he's kind of drinking at the end. <laughs> and no, 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 <laughs> definitely not going to drink that. So the next wine we've got is our another um, on-premise brand, THP. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've had this one too. I think, yeah, uh, Tempranillo. This, yeah. this won a nice, uh, won a good medal at, at Texom International Wine Awards 20, mm -hmm. 2019. Anyways, this uh, particular brand is all focused on um, blending, which is funny because we pretty much blend everything, but also yeah. it really highlights that on the label. And, and um, THB stands for Texas Hocus Pocus, and it's for winemakers who believe in the magic of blending. Yeah. <laughs> we do around here, okay? And it just so happens to be the same initials as Texas High Plains. That's right. Which is where this wine is coming all, from anyway. Where all the fruit comes from. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they're, they're Texas High Plains Appalachian Wines. Yeah. Um, they, um, once again, we kind of incorporate postmodern winemaking plus traditional. This, is, this particular wine gets very traditional you know, aging and the fact that it spends um, about 12 months in Italian uh, Tuscan terracotta okay. uh, tanks. So you, you saw these when we were in the barrel room. Real quick, because it looks like my battery is running a little low, I'm gonna plug in something to the camera while we continue to do this. So you can keep kind of talking about the- um, Sure. About the wine. So Tempranillo just does very well in Texas. Um, it's very expressive from vineyard to vineyard. Um, this particular Tempranillo um, came from uh, multiple multiple vineyard sites on the High Plains, um, uh, including a vineyard in Terry County and a vineyard in uh, Dawson County. Uh, we blended in a little bit of Tanat, which is another variety that is doing extremely well in the state of Texas. Um, okay. These are these are varieties that just like our hot climate. Um, they typically, they don't have a really long growing season, the Tanat does, but the Tempranillo is typically harvested like the end of August, sometimes into September. I'm gonna go to my car and get a cable. All right, so we're back. I had to go get a battery and a cable <laughs> so that the phone wouldn't die on me. <laughs> so, I guess we're um, kind of chatty. We're, we were uh, chatty, running yeah. down the battery. Um, so where do we leave off on this? Well, singing the praises of Tempranillo, on the, yeah. grown on the Texas High Plains. Yeah, um, it lo really likes our climate. It's very expressive from vineyard to vineyard. Um, this is a blend of Tempranillo and Tanat, and Tanat's another variety that does pretty well out here. Yeah, um, another heat-loving, you know, thick-skinned, long, longer-growing season um, variety. But um, yeah, this is a this particular blend. It's it's unique in the fact that it doesn't get a lot of um, a lot of new oak influence. It spends some time, mm -hmm. you know, most of its life aging in terracotta. Uh, the ones pots. that we saw, yeah, 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 yeah we Fora. I totally forgot about those. Yeah, yeah, and so it gets a really nice texture. It gets it kind of highlights the fruity uh, component, fruity and a little bit of a um, you know earthy component that the Tempranillo brings. Um, kind of highlights that instead of overwhelming it with oak. Mm -hmm. um, I like to do that, you know, uh, in particular to the Tempranillo that we we source. Um, if it's showcasing um, a fruity aspect or even an earthiness, um, I like to, I want to showcase that instead of like doing a traditional Spanish Rioja where you put a ton of American oak right, and yeah. age it forever. So it's it's um, we've kind of developed our own technique in making this per this particular brand of, of Tempranillo.
So more New World on the nose. If it's anywhere mm -hmm. akin to Spain, maybe more Toro, less uh, Rioja, more of a right yeah, yeah. Western Ribera or something. Yeah, and and that's one thing. Like you know, I really like the Tempranillo grape, but yeah, the Rioja is a little earthier. Ribera tends to be a little fruitier. Um, and you know, it's it's got a couple more years than what what you know what we tasted yeah. earlier. Um, and you get the complexity. I even get like on the on the retro nasal, like when I was like breathing out through my nose, um, I did get a little bit of a spice component, almost yeah, a, almost a little bit of the earth component in there. I almost got a. It's funny you say that because I got like a cinnamon, like a yeah. hint of a cinnamon, which is a very earthy spice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, we thought this was a. It's really showing well right now. This is one of those wines where it's at the stage in its life where. Um, you know, wins a great award at a competition. It's great at the table. It's good on its own. Um, and of course, we're almost sold out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so get it while you can, I guess, if you like the style of Tempranillo. Yeah. That's one of the things I do when I, when I taste is like I'll keep it in my mouth as I'm, as I'm sucking in air and I'll, I'll stop and I'll breathe out through my nose just so I can get that. Get in. I, I do, I'll, I'll smell mm -hmm. different things that way um, if I do that. Very chewy. Mm hmm But you're right, the retronasal aromatics, which is, you know, that's what wine mainly is, right? I mean, you get all the flavor from the Pretty aromatics. Much it, that's every, yeah. It's everything, but when you force it out, when you have the wine in your mouth and you breathe out through your nose, you're really getting everything, not just like the just the the esters going through your yeah through your the the ritual nasal cavities and that but yeah it's, but I it's like getting it that like that old world spiciness you're mm -hmm. talking about so yeah that's good it's tasting really good really nice so um, do you want to like quickly do the last one or yeah, something I mean, a little more poured it. It. <laughs> I mean you decanted it I feel I did, like a I shame did. We that we well. don't <laughs> I mean or we could just crush it off camera but um, <laughs> last wine. <laughs> Because this could go on all day. Yeah. And it kind of has, right? It kind of has. And now you, you got a tasting group later today, right? I do. This is yeah. warm up. So I'm pouring this wrong. Let me do it that way. There you go. So this is our, um, this is a San Jose. And this is one of those rare instances where um, it is 100% of one variety. Yeah. And we typically don't do that. At Yano, we typically blend everything. Um, this is a 2014, we called it Reserva, mm -hmm. and it's an extended barrel aged uh, Sangiovese. Okay. And the Sangiovese in this case, um, it's blended in the sense that it's two different vineyards. It's some from the Newsom Vineyard and some from the Ready Vineyards. Okay. 100% Texas High Plains. And it spent um, a little over two years in barrels, <clears throat> um, mostly neutral. There, there was a few. Um, and neutral wood is like usually three to four years or older. Um, this may have had like a three second fill or third year, third filled barrel. Okay. So I think maybe you're getting not quite, some, not quite, quite neutral, but cl yeah, pretty close. Pretty close, yeah. So there might be a little bit of a kind of a toasted oak character that's incorporated in. But mainly just um, showcase what, uh, you know, the high plains can do when it comes to these these other Italian, well, this isn't really an other variety. This is a pretty pretty strong Italian <laughs> variety. <laughs> yeah. But maybe other varieties that most people don't know. Um, the non French varieties. Non French everyone, varieties. Everyone makes are, those, but yeah. it seems like, you know, uh, quite a few Texas wineries will make uh, Italian varieties, whether the white or red. Yeah. You know, like we hit the Alianico earlier today, uh, San Giovese, you know, I've seen, you know, Vermentinos and Trebbianos. You know, from several other winemakers, and you know the the uh, the consensus seems to be that you know they do well here. Um, you know, I, I know Texas is a big state, and it's not the same climate and same weather all over. But nope. you know, we seem to do really well with with um, not just you know the the Spanish variety uh, with with Tempranillo, but also with. Um, also with a lot of the Italian varieties, even the, even the white varieties. So. Yeah, and one that you would typically find in a Mediterranean climate. Yeah. So um, different expression than what you would see from, um, you know, parts of Tuscany, you know, parts yeah. of Italy that, that grow in a big way. Different, uh, different than what you'd see on the West Coast. But mm -hmm. um, it's becoming, Sangiovese is a pretty important red grape for us. Not as important as Tempranillo 
or Cabernet uh, Cabernet Sauvignon here, but it's it's another one of those where it's pretty expressive from vineyard to vineyard. Holds up pretty well in the bottle. Yeah, um, it's just unique, and you'll 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 see a lot of producers making this. You don't see it on the shelf pretty much ever in a grocery store. Yeah, I mean, these are you're gonna have to go to the it's winery pretty rare, to yeah. get it. Yeah, but they might see a couple money. examples here and there, but it's it's not like it's it's not the. Uh, it's not the grape you normally see. I think I think what it is is just people just kind of they know the grape, and I think I think it's just I think it's really just the even, even with Alianico, which even when you, when you see that on the shelf, it's kind of like well that's just a grape no one knows how to pronounce. Yeah, Aglianico. Aglianico, yeah, and um, uh, so it, it's kind of like you know uh, uh, Viognier. You know, yep. the, the, these are grapes that are not the common grapes that we're, everyone's used to, so they, they think it's a Viognier or something like that, yeah. you know? Well, I guess what I was going to say is most people don't know that, I mean, people know Chianti. Yeah, they, they know, know Chianti. Regions. They don't know it's Sangiovese, though. Yeah. But, I mean, it is. Heck, until, <laughs> mostly, until, mostly. until I got into the industry, I didn't know I didn't know what Chianti was. I didn't know if it was the grape variety. I just knew it was a red wine from Italy. And that's yeah. about it. It's a region. But... Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's all I knew. It's a red wine, and it, and it came in. It came in the. It came in the, the straw, the bottles, right? You know. Mm -hmm. But this is getting into that secondary and tertiary. Yeah, there's a little. Um, there's a little Brett component here. There is, yeah, and uh, it adds to the overall character of the wine. It's not overdone. There's definitely. Um, you know the the earthiness is kind of outdoing the fruitiness. Yeah, but this I get is... the earthiness more on the palate than I do on the nose. Um, you know, this is something where I think you can't mistake that it's Sangiovese. You might, you might. That's a compliment, and I'll take it. I think, I think <laughs> in a blind tasting, if I brought this to the group or you brought this to your group, and they would probably, I would say, probably most of these people would say this is Sangiovese, but it may be like not a Chianti, but it's probably like you know a, a, a super Tuscan style, or yeah. or just a, 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 a just a Tuscan Sangiovese, but it's just not in just not in Chianti, and not it wasn't in Brunello, it wasn't in Vino you know, Noble. It was like in an area of Tuscany that doesn't have anything other than Tuscan, it's like an IGT or something. an IGT, yeah. and, and that's it. And, and I think you could you could make a case that and maybe a little more modern. Style winemaking, and then you un unveil it in Texas, and, and, and their like, heads spin off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that's the cool thing. I mean, this is a lot of the time. You know, our wines. We don't serve a lot of aged wines. We don't have. You can't. Mm -hmm. You can't find an older Texas wine out there. So um, I don't know. It's fun to do this. It's right. fun to, to taste these wines that have. Yeah, little, I mean, this is not even that old, but it's like. I don't know. Did you mention it was from fourteen? Yeah, twenty. I don't know if I did, but it's twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. This is another one of those you can only find it at the winery. Yeah. And it did. I think it. I think decanting it was the right choice. Mm -hmm. I'd actually had never decanted it. I usually just spin the, you know, put it in the glass and give it a lot of swirls. Um, but yeah, decanting was the right thing, and this is uh, this is showing pretty well. Yeah, and this is great. It needs some food though. Oh, this needs some food. <laughs> Which which brings us to it's about lunchtime, so we're yeah. gonna wrap this up. We are. <laughs> <laughs> More important things to do. I'm gonna just crush the rest of this because I don't want to. I mean, I've been really good. I spent everything. I'm gonna crush the rest of this. Yeah, because <laughs> well, I'm food soon. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Salute. Salute. As, as 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 our country, as our mother country, father country, <laughs> would, would country would say. That's right. So um, we're gonna wrap this up, folks. Um, Thank you all for stopping by. You can click the links above, frame me up. I'll have links below uh, for Yana Staccato. Um, so check that out. Um, yes, we have a lot of winery only or wine club only wines. So that's your incentive to get your butts here to Lubbock <laughs> and check out check out the winery for yourself. Um, join the wine club. <clears throat> um, and um, you know, they got some excellent wines here. And it's, again, I like to I like champion Texas championing being champion, whatever. I like advocating for Texas wine uh, because we do make good wine here. Um, just like every other state and every other country in the world, there's really good, there's some halfway decent, and there's really bad wine. So just because it's from California or from France or Italy doesn't mean it's automatically great wine because I've, I've had, I've had, especially in <laughs> France, I've had the bottom, I've had like the three euro bottle wines. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had those wines and I mean, they're table wines. You know, that's what, that's what the average person drinks there. So anyway, so yeah, do all that and uh, we'll see everyone again next time. Cheers. 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 <laughs>